We have some reading materials here, if someone could help hand them out. As you glance over the materials, you'll probably notice several things. One is there's a lot. <laughs> I'm not expecting to cover everything in equal depth. Some of the passages we'll spend a lot of time on, some of them we'll have to skip over or skim over, let's put it that way. But I wanted you to have enough material to take home with you to look at after the, after the presentation. Today, what I'd like to do is basically get the basic principles down of dependent core rising. And in particular, how dependent core rising relates to the practice of meditation, how it relates to the practice in general. Oftentimes, the, the topic of dependent core rising can get so abstract that it seems to have no relationship at all to what you're doing as you focus on your breath or as you focus on your body at the present moment. But it's all very, very much related. In fact, this is a map that shows you know, where different practices fit into the whole, the whole question of why they're suffering and how you can put an end to it. There is a passage where the Buddha said that that was what he taught, just suffering and the end of suffering. And this is in response to our normal reaction to suffering, which is twofold. One, bewilderment. The question, why am I suffering? Why is this pain happening? Why am I suffering now? And then secondly, the search. Is there somebody who knows a way out? The Buddha is responding to that double reaction. You might think back to when you were a child and you had pain in your stomach. And of course, at that point, you couldn't even speak or didn't even know you had a stomach. You just knew you had pain. And you had no idea why it was. And so you were looking for help outside, i.e. your mother or your father, to take care of the pain. And pretty much that's how we've related to suffering ever since. Now, our bewilderment is, has a reason, as we'll see. The, the, the causes of suffering that the Buddha lays out here are, fairly, are very complex. And that what he's trying to do is take that bewilderment, which often turns into ignorance, which causes more suffering, and actually give an answer to why we're suffering and to give a specific m map for why we're suffering, what we can do about putting an end to it. Um, that statement that the Buddha made, he teaches suffering and the end of suffering. I've actually seen it someplace translated as the Buddha saying, I teach one thing and one thing only, suffering and the end of suffering. Um, sounds like two. Um, in fact, I've actually run across one teacher who says, it really is one. Your suffering and your end of suffering are the one thing. As long as you open up to your suffering allowed to happen, then there's no suffering. That's not what the Buddha taught. They are two things. <coughs> suffering is one thing. The end of suffering is something else. We study suffering to find out why it happens so we can put an end to its causes. Dependent core rising is an analysis of those causes and conditions. So when we know the terrain of the, the larger map, then we can figure out how we're going to work our path through that terrain so we can get to the end of suffering. Um, as I said, the basic principle is you don't attack suffering head on. You look for the causes and then treat the causes first, and then you get to the end of suffering. Back when I was teaching English in Chiang Mai University, I had to teach a passage on analyzing problems. And I figured, well, if this was, we're in Thailand, we use the Four Noble Truths. You have a problem, you look for the cause. And so the first thing I had the kids write was advertisements. Women don't like you. Maybe you're not masculine enough. Maybe you should smoke. You know? <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> Men don't like you. Maybe you need to have fresher skin. I mean, and it goes on, that kind of stuff. And then from there, we worked up to you know, analyzing social problems. Most of the kids in the class were social science majors, so we did social problems. But this is the basic problem-solving approach. You have a problem. You don't attack the problem directly. You attack the cause. So here we're going to be looking at the various causes and then looking at the various practices the Buddha has for attacking those particular causes. The plan for the day is to go through a sketch of dependent core rising um, in the morning and then go back and go through some of the various factors in more detail. So first you get the overall picture and then we go back and work on some of the more detailed things. Before we look at these Pattern. So first, I would like to make a few general remarks. One is if you look at the list, page one and page two, that's passage number three, you'll see that it's very complex. Um, you've got lots of factors reappearing in many spots. 
For example, you have, for example, you have ignorance as a record position for fabrications. Fabrications, when you look into them, you discover fabrications include feeling. We're further on down in the list. Feeling is another factor. And then it comes under stress and pain at the end. So feeling again. So feeling comes into the pattern three times. We'll find that your knowledge or lack of knowledge of the Four Noble Truths is going to come into the pattern at several times as well. So what you've got is many feedback loops. Dependent co-rising is not a circle. Sometimes you see it depicted as, as a circle, but it's not. I mean, it is the case that sometimes when you start with ignorance and you go through the cycle to suffering and then in relationship to the ignorance, there's more bewilderment, excuse me, there's a re- reaction to suffering, there is more bewilderment, which leads to more ignorance. That can cycle it through again. But you find that there are other places where the cycle feeds back on itself in very complex ways. So it's not just a circle. If it were a circle, you couldn't get off. You'd be stuck. But this has many loops and they can kind of spin you off. You can get out. Okay. That's one factor to keep in mind. Second issue to keep in mind is that there's some time scale issues. There are some interpretations that say these factors all happen instantaneously. You can see all of them happening very, very quickly in the, in the course of a moment. There's another interpretation that says you can see it happen only over many lifetimes. And the way it's described in here, it doesn't really tell you one way or the other. But when we start focusing in on the Buddhist teachings on causality and the different feedback loops, you'll find that basically what it comes down to is both. Dependent core rising does function this way over many lifetimes, long, long time scale periods, and it can also happen instantaneously. In fact, it's the combination of the instantaneous causality and the long-term causality that allow you actually to get out. Um, we'll, we'll discuss that particular point in a moment. So you can look at this. I mean, if it were if it were only instantaneous, then there would be no pattern in your lifetime. It would just kind of you'd have one instance of suffering, and then it would be followed by kind of nothing connected to it. Um, if it happened only over many lifetimes, you wouldn't know if the path worked. You know, suppose you put an end to ignorance, and it required three more lifetimes, to, you know, <laughs> to get out of the cycle. Well, you wouldn't know. And putting an end to ignorance does it really work? We have to wait three lifetimes to find out. Or if you put an end to craving and you have to find out into your next lifetime if it's going to put an end to suffering, um, it'd be, it would be impossible to study this. If it were only instantaneous, then we couldn't talk about you know, factors operating over time. So it's a combination of the two. Third thing you want to notice is as you look down the factors here, um, contact at the sixth sense media comes about halfway through the process. So things don't start with sensory contact. The basic message here is that you bring an awful lot to any moment of contact. I mean, you're sitting here right now. You're bringing memories of the past, attitudes you picked up from the past, your idea of what's important to notice, what's not important to notice. All these things are being brought to the present moment. So the present moment is not a tabula rasa. It's not a blank slate. You come in with an awful lot of preconceived notions, and it's the preconceived notions that are going to determine whether you suffer or don't suffer. This, is, I mean, this right here explains one of the reasons why we train the mind. You have to train the mind so that you bring skillful things into the present moment. You bring skillful perceptions, skillful attitudes towards feelings, skillful ideas into your present moment experience. It also points out your um, fabrications, which is one of the factors that precedes sensory experience or sensory contact is the intentional element. So prior to your sensory experience, already there are a lot of intentions shaping what you're going to focus on, what you're going to notice, what you're not going to notice, how you relate to things. So again, this is the, the training of the mind is primarily training in intention because this is the big factor that shapes things. However, even bigger than intention is the primacy of ignorance. Ignorance is the big factor in this line up. As you know, it starts with ignorance. Now, he's, the Buddha doesn't use ignorance as a prime mover. You're probably surprised to know that I've been spending the last month reading about 12th century Catholic theology. <laughs> um, back in college, my, my field was medieval intellectual history, and I still have, you know, I still have a soft spot for you know, Peter Lombard and Thomas Aquinas and those people. But every now and then it gets to me exactly what they're actually saying. Um, Original sin. <laughs> I still cannot understand original sin. Um, and they couldn't either. Um, <laughs> but 
you see a lot of their thinking about you know, proofs of God's existence. Have, you have to have a prime mover. Otherwise, you can't explain everything. But you will notice that in the, the Buddha's interpretation of causality, you don't need a prime mover. In fact, given the way you have all these feedbacks, feedback loops, you can't have a prime mover because if a cause has an effect, the effect can also come back and have an influence on the cause. This rules out prime movers. So you basically what you're doing is you're finding yourself in the midst of a system that's been in operation for a long time. And however, it's, it, it's, it's got influences coming in from the past, but it's also got input from the present moment. This is what keeps it going. So you don't have a prime mover keeping it going. It's got your present input keeping it going, which means that you can look into the present moment to take things apart. But the primary way that ignorance functions is you know, ignorance is the big issue in the present moment. When you learn how to overcome ignorance, the whole system starts falling apart. Now, it's not just any kind of ignorance. And we'll get into this in more detail later, but I just want to make a quick point here. It's not ignorance of your true nature. It's not ignorance of anything or any principle that you could say either you know or you don't know. It's ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. Now, each of the Four Noble Truths is regarded as a category for analyzing your experience. It's a way of looking. And each of those categories has a task that you learn how to develop as a skill. So this ignorance and lack of ignorance is not just an either or, all for nothing. Either you totally know or you totally don't know. It's one of these forms of knowledge that you develop over time, you develop as a skill. This is one of the reasons why the question of sudden awakening versus gradual awakening never came up in the Theravada tradition. In the Mahayana, it's a question of do you know your Buddha nature, do you not know your Buddha nature? It's either yes or no, which meant that you had to have sudden awakening. And sudden awakening, if you focused on gradual practices, would get, get in the way of understanding your, your, your Buddha nature. So there was this real problem about sudden versus gradual. But from in Independent Core Rising, the Buddha analyzes ignorance in terms of, as I said, four categories for analyzing your experience and then four tasks with regard to each of those categories that you've got to learn how to develop as a skill. So in developing as a skill, you, a gradual process does actually work, get you to a point where you're fully skillful and then you can drop. Then the ignorance is sufficient to cut through things. So if you don't take any other point home from today, that's the point to take home. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, you've, you've probably heard, if, if you have any experience in hearing about dependent core rising, we hear people talking about cutting the causal loop at a particular spot, like either the spot between feeling into craving, or sometimes it's the spot between name and form and consciousness. And when you cut it at these different spots, what it actually means is that you actually bring knowledge of the Four Noble Truths to that factor or to that relationship. So it's always a question of you know, bringing ignorance or not having ignorance with regard to that particular topic. In fact, there are two suttas in the canon. There's one is Majjhima 9, and the other is Sutta Nibhata 3.12, which point out that you can take this quality of knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, apply it at any spot in, the, in this list of factors, and the whole thing will fall apart. There's not just one spot where you can take it apart. There are many spots, but it always the, the primary issue there is what kind of knowledge are you bringing to that link in causality? One final point, in terms of just the overall pattern, is that there are alternative patterns. There's the classic list of 12, 12 factors, which I've given you here. But there's, there's another place where the Buddha talks about it in terms of 10 factors. And you'll see other discussions where it starts out, say, it starts out at sensory contact, and then the question of bringing knowledge to sensory contact, and that, that's another pattern. What it turns out, though, is that they don't make any genuine difference. Because even in the shortened patterns, all the factors are there. For example, in the one where the Buddha has ten factors, um, you see here we have ignorance leading to fabrication, fabrication leading to consciousness, consciousness leading to name and form. In the shortened version, you have consciousness and name and form acting as causes or conditions for each other. The images of two sheaths of uh, reeds leaning on each other. If you pull one away, the other will fall, fall down. You need consciousness in order there to be an experience of name and form. You need to have name and form for consciousness to have an object. So the two of them need each other in this way. Um, and the question is, well, what happened to fabrications and ignorance? I thought they were the most important parts of this, fa of this cycle here. 
Well, it turns out fabrications is included in name, as is ignorance or lack of ignorance. There's also a quality of name. So it's all there. It's just it's been allotted different spots in the cycle. So the practical effect is all the same, because what it comes down to is how you pay attention to things and what your intentions are. Those are the two factors that are going to make all the difference. How you pay attention and what your intentions are. Two other points I would like to focus on. Actually, there are three. Um, Before I open the, the floor to questions. First is the nature of the factors in dependent core rising. These are all events processes. Um, there was one point where the monk said, when the Buddha says birth, um, from birth as a requisition comes aging and death. And the monk raises his hand and says, wait a minute, who is birth? Birth of what? And the Buddha said, you know, if I had said somebody's birth, that would be a, that would be a le- legitimate question. He says, I'm not talking about who's there. Just the question of there is the, the event of birth happening. And so on down the line. In all these cases, if there's no question, he refuses to answer the question of whose birth this is, or whose craving this is, or whose feeling this is. He also doesn't ask, say whether there is nobody there at all. He says you just focus on the level of events, without asking who is behind it or is there nobody behind it. You're just looking at events in and of themselves. Now many of us do carry around the idea, okay, who's there behind all this? And the Buddha says, well, actually, you can explain that in terms of these causal factors, where that idea comes from. So it's looking, many of us, boy, this is why we're not supposed to bring food in here. Okay. <laughs> have an idea of sort of the world out there and then events happening in the world. And we had our framework as what explains the events. And the Buddha turns it around. He says, here's a system of events. From the system of events, we can have our, we can explain why we have ideas of a framework back there. And we can ask ourselves, does our ideas of the framework, do they cause suffering or not? That's the issue that we're working on. Okay. So those are the factors. Then there's a question, question of the relationship between the factors. Um, as you go from one factor to the next, does one factor cause the next? Is it a necessary cause? Is it a sufficient cause? Or is it just a condition? The Buddha himself doesn't really say. But as you look in, as we get into the discussion later on, you'll see that it's primarily conditions. You know, ignorance will condition the way you fabricate things. The way you fabricate things is going to condition your consciousness. The type of consciousness you bring, and how, how it's already been fabricated, to your experience of physical events and mental events is going to determine what, how, whether you suffer from these things or not. So it's the type of conditioning that we're talking here. Now, conditioning here, the Buddha says, is this, that conditionality. And that's going to be the second topic that we're going to focus on in the, in the readings. So, but before we start going into the readings, I'd want to know if there are any questions you have about any of this sort of background material. Yes. There were three comments about the nature of the factors. Three comments about the nature of the factors. One, that they were processes and events. The second... The, the relationship between the factors, was there a third thing? The third thing was going to be the relationship called this, that conditionality. This, this that conditionality, which okay. is reading number three. Okay, thanks. So that, that's what we'll get to later. Too early for questions? Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Name and form? We'll get into that and we'll get into particulars. I just wanted to look at the whole sort of structure of things first. Question in the back. Can you say again this, the one thing you wanted us to take away from this talk if okay. we got nothing okay. else? So think, <laughs> just in case. Okay. 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 Ignorance is the primary factor that's causing you to suffer. And the question is, what kind of ignorance? Is it just general ignorance? And the Buddha says it's a specific kind of ignorance. It's not seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, which are not just four facts that you need to know, but they're four categories for analyzing your experience. You look at any one experience and ask yourself, okay, where is there suffering here? Where is the suffering? And then you look at what's actually contributing to causing that suffering right now. 
what can be done to put an end to that cause? And then finally, is, is there an experience of being released from the suffering? Those are the four things you want to look for. And each of those four things has a task. You try to comprehend suffering. You try to abandon the cause. You try to develop the path and you try to realize the cessation. So four things you could do at any one moment. And because that's the kind of ignorance that the Buddha is trying to have us overcome, it's not a question of knowing something or not knowing something. It's having the categories and then learning how to be skillful with regard to those categories. Now that kind of knowledge, skillful knowledge, or the knowledge of a skill is something you develop over time. So it's not an all or nothing kind of issue, which is why the issue of sudden and gradual awakening never came up in Theravada. It's both sudden and gradual. I mean, you work towards it gradually, then finally, whoop, you you get the point. So working on a gradual path does not get in the way of full awakening. So it's because that's the nature of the ignorance that's that's what we're working on here. We're working on a skill rather than trying to realize a particular thing or realize a particular principle and then go home. So that's what I want you to take home with you is that we're working on a skill.